My name is JT Parr, and I'm traveling the country to interview geniuses and find out how the world works. After talking to Nathya Sathana about the brain, I had some unanswered questions. What is consciousness? How does the mind process language? Is free will an illusion? To tackle these issues, I met with Dr. Martin Monti, a professor of neuroscience and psychology at UCLA. He uses innovative imaging techniques to communicate with patients in minimally conscious states. Here's our conversation. It's always exciting to talk about science. I just enjoy um, giving what I find uh, to everybody. I'm extremely irritated by the 10% myth of the brain. I hate movies that keep using that myth. But what are some examples of movies like that? I managed to not watch Limitless. And then he takes this miracle drug, the Limitless drug, and all of a sudden, because you know most human beings are stuck at 10% of their brain capacity, he supersedes that. And then all of a sudden, he's firing on all cylinders. It's just a very optimistic movie about what can happen if we can get past that 10% threshold. Why is the brain not handsome? I think it's beautiful. It's wrinkly. Well, but it's very important that it's wrinkly. If we want to have a bigger brain, if we want to pack more brain into the same, the same space, we actually need to crumple it a little. It's bit. those grooves. So it's those so new good. grooves are like new brain outgrowth. All right, so to this bat thing yes. with our boy Fagel. Um, Nagel. Right. Um, it doesn't matter. But when Nagel was like, yo, this is what it's like to be a bat, it was interesting to me because, like, why wouldn't it just be, instead, what does it mean to is a bat? Well, that is a good question, but I think it's slightly different than the question he was trying to get at. I know that I'm conscious and I can feel that I am conscious. Um, I can feel that I'm experiencing this conversation right now, but I don't know that you are in the same way that I am. Right, it's a totally unique experience for you. It is a totally unique experience. And there's experience. no way to know if my experience corresponds to yours. No, in fact, I don't even, I'm not even 100% sure that you have consciousness. I infer that you do, but I have no 100% scientific proof that you are conscious just like me. As far as I know, everything around me could, could, be, could be not conscious in the same way that I am. What? I got nothing. Are you conscious? I've been unconscious before, and I don't remember it. I somehow don't doubt that. Why? That you don't remember being unconscious. Oh, I thought you were saying you don't doubt that I've been knocked unconscious. I thought you were talking shit. Which parts of the brain are associated with language? Um, well, um, there certainly are a couple parts of the brain that are really key to language. One part of the brain, they tend to be in, in the left hemisphere for most people. And the one which is towards the front of our brain is known as Broca's area. That part of the brain seems to be really important for producing language and for producing the, the syntax of language. So when you produce complex sentences that have embeddings, uh, you're, you're probably exercising that part of the brain. So people who, because of, for example, brain injury, lose that part of the brain, they tend to have what is known as telegraphic speech. Uh, short sentences, individual words, united by you know, conjunctions. Um, so that part of the brain, we know, is, is very important for our ability to both understand and produce language. There's another part of the brain further in the back, known as Wernicke's area. That part of the brain seems to be more important for meaning and for using the right words to refer to the right things. What if someone gets the one if part If somebody up? gets a lesion to the posterior one, Wernicke's area, what you will typically see is that they, they produce sentences that are grammatically correct, but, but they use the wrong words. Um, often, sometimes people refer to that informally as a, a, a word salad. Uh, the words are just all the wrong ones. It's unclear if they realize that they're using the wrong words, though. Right, and the meaning part's like the dressing. Uh, um, For the salad to be satisfying, <laughs> you need dressing. For the communication to be satisfying and functional, you certainly need meaning. Why is it called Broca's area? Uh, well, um, that comes from the French doctor who had a patient uh, who he called, referred to as Tan, because that was the only word he could speak. And after Tan died, uh, Paul Broca. Uh, he, the only word he could say was Tan. The only word he could say was Tan. So they named him that to his face. Tan could only say Tan, had lost his, uh, um, his uh, productive language. 
Um, and after he died, Paul Brocal looked at his brain, and it turns out he had a lesion in the part of the brain that today we call Broca's area. And that's how it was first associated with, uh, with language. So it seems to me that you can get something in the brain named after you in two ways. One, you can discover that part of the brain, or two, you can be the person who got that part of their brain fucked up. Which one do you think I have a better shot of accomplishing? It's not a target you should set for yourself because today we just don't do that anymore. Today we tend to use words that refer to where exactly in the brain something is. So there might be an area called the temporoparietal junction, or there might be an a frontal gyrus or an inferior frontal gyrus. Why is it inferior? Well, it's inferior only because of its location, because it's right under uh, the middle frontal gyrus. So being shorter is worse? Uh, being lower is a position in space. <laughs> Amen, brother. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry, I'll take a breath, can I? <laughs> no, no, go for it, go for it. Um, no, it's good to laugh. Who, who's Sharon? That is actually Ariel Sharon, uh, which was the late uh, Prime Minister of Israel. He was one of his nation's most controversial figures, a ferocious military strategist and hard-nosed politician, whose life and career spanned Israel's entire 65-year history. Oh, she was the one who got... He yes. was the one oh, who guy. survived the severe brain injury but entered a disorder of consciousness. Did you have any personal dealings with the, his situation? So there, there was a, a time in the course of his disease when uh, I had been asked to make a specialized evaluation of uh, Mr. Sharon uh, because it wasn't clear where exactly he fell in the continuum of disorders of consciousness, if he had some level of consciousness or if he didn't. So they asked me to, to do a specialized evaluation using MRI of him to understand how much cognition he was capable of. They would show Mr. Sharon a pictures of houses that he wouldn't know, just random houses. And then they would show him a picture of his own house. And in areas of his brain lit up with his own house that didn't light up with the random houses. Is that, that's like your primary interest, right? Is, is communicating with people who are in these undetermined states of consciousness? Imagine if somebody were conscious but couldn't move. How would you ever get to know that they are conscious? To get around that, um, I've developed uh, with my colleagues when I was in Cambridge a uh, technique to have somebody, rather than you know, move a foot or move a finger, to actually think about something. Some mental activities produce fairly stereotypical activations. For example, if I asked you to you know, close your eyes and imagine playing tennis, there's a part in between your two hemispheres, and you can open your eyes at this point. But while you were doing it... I was it, a doll. Now, if you had been in an MRI machine, I could have seen that part of the brain get engaged in activity. Are we our brain? I think in common culture, most people tend to think that there's something more to us than just our brain. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, we call that a soul. I don't know if there is a ghost in the machine. I think the machine just operates and we're kind of just watching it go, but we have this illusion of agency and, and consciousness. That's Thank why I don't think my buddy Critter should be in jail. You raise a really important, um, a really important point. If we are our brain, and, and of course our brain has the mechanisms that it has, and it's a deterministic machine, are we ever responsible for anything that we do? It's a little bit like my emotions are like Pinocchio sometimes. I got the strings on Pinocchio and I'm like, oh, I got you, Pinocchio. Like, you're not gonna go light that hill on fire. You're not gonna go like, you know, house a bunch of beers and pick a fight with like the woman you love the most. But then sometimes it feels like Pinocchio's got the strings on me. Your metaphor of Pinocchio really hits on, uh, on what we think is an important aspect of how the human brain works. Wow, I'm so glad I nailed that. Let me see if there's any other questions in here. I'm, I'm actually, my girlfriend's pregnant with twins and I feel a bit uh, limited in terms of my uh, capacity, both as a, a thinker and just as a feeler. And I'm hoping through this process, I'll gain more skills so that I can teach my kids about things that uh, I, I never learned about. It's a very noble goal. Dude, my dog, that was fire. All right, well. Thank you for bringing it. Hit me up if you want to come to the jiu-jitsu studio. I'd love to introduce you to everyone. Thank Sensei you. would love you.